Hi, can everyone hear me? Hey, there they all are. Hello there. Hello, you beautiful people. Um, thank you for joining us here on the sidetrack for the first day of JSConf. Yes, one woo there from somebody. Thank you. Very excited. Um, more woos. Come on. Come on. Woo! There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we've got somebody who has flown in here from Minnesota, which I believe is in the United States of America. Um, I don't really know about these things. Um, it's got something very, very excited lined up. I think it was meant to be a tag team special originally, but we've lost 50% of the duo due to a bit of a throat illness. So please be very, very kind to the remaining half of the gang. Zachary Johnson. Hi, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm really, really excited to be speaking to this audience. Um, thanks so much to the committee and the volunteers for inviting us and for putting on this event. Um, so I'm Zach Johnson, or Zachary Johnson. Um, Andy Raitano is supposed to be up here. He's back at our uh, flat, sick. Uh, he got in and like, got a, like lost his voice and got a horrible cough and a fever. And so he's totally knocked out. And I told him, you know, I got this uh, sleep until 7.30. We got another thing at 7.30 tonight on the other stage with more interactive demos because a big component of... This is more the how talk and we'll have more play tonight at 7.30. So I'm hoping that he can sleep uh, and, and join us. Um, I was going to tell you that he got, you know, eaten by a shark or something. That was more exciting, but whatever. Um, so Andy is uh, an electrical engineer by trade. Um, so, you know, he worked on, like, submarine navigation systems and all this electri electrical engineering stuff, and he got into chip tunes in the electronic music scene and started doing visualizations with Nintendos and Sega uh, to tell you a little bit about him. Um, and because he's not here, I just want to say that Andy always wanted to be a game genie when he grew up. And this project gets him a little close. Okay, uh, me, um, I have, you know, Zach Johnson, pretty common name, except for maybe the Zach part. So I go by Zachstronaut online. Um, you can find a bunch of my projects at zachstronaut.com. Um, that little uh, pixel art astronaut's kind of my character. Um, so some of the things I worked on, I, uh, if you're familiar with Adventure Time on Cartoon Network, um, I uh, did the programming for the BMO app where you can have your own anthropomorphic BMO. And that entire app, it was number one in the App Store uh, was probably four or five years ago already. The whole app was done uh, in PhoneGap. The entire thing was uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, and was number one. It did, it did really well for Cartoon Network. Um, a couple other things I've done, uh, if you remember in the United States, there was uh, legislation called SOPA, and there was a big internet blackout. Um, I did an open source template for that that had like an animated spotlight effect um, that many websites used. Um, and I'm also a game developer, and then in the bottom corner there is a game called uh, Joggernauts that you can ask me about. Um, kind of the big thing I'm working on right now. Uh, my background's web, but I've really been getting into games and interactive stuff. So I'm going to do what is Nespector, tell you the story of how it came to be. Um, and then get into kind of the nitty gritty of how it works. But, uh, you know, got 25 minutes to do all this. So find me in the community area if you want to talk shop and get into the nitty gritty of this. And then if you want to play with more demos, because we have a bunch of different things you can do with this tool uh, tonight at 7.30 on the main stage during dinner. Okay, so this is going to go audience interactive. So I should have left it up for just a hair longer so you can see it in the back. So get out your smartphones. And if you do have data, if you have LTE, you're going to have a better time with that, actually, than Wi-Fi, I, I think. So pull up your smartphone. You're going to be able to control an NES from your smartphone. Go to nestspector.com. It should forward you to the address you want to be at. Um, and crank up your volume on your phone, if you, if you would, for more fun. So let's leave this up for a hair longer, nestspector.com. If anybody has gotten that to work, just one thumbs up would be awesome. Okay. All right, so what we're going to do here is a little live demo of what this thing is. Uh, Got to open a couple browser windows. This is actually uh, tonight, hopefully, if Andy's well, we're going to have the physical Nintendo, and I'll explain that in my talk. This is an M script and compiled emulator um, running in so it's JavaScript. I'm going to pull up Mario Brothers here, um, and I will have to play. So, that's good and loud, okay. 
go over here. And then be real nice to me. Okay, okay. Just looking behind the curtain here. Okay, Mario mode. Uh, all right, that's a good sound. Okay, so on your smartphones, you should start to see... There you go. People are already... There you go. So I'll just play this completely normal game of Mario. This is an unmodified ROM. This is the original game, and I'll explain what's actually going on, because it's... Oh my, okay. Because it's completely the original ROM. This is devolving quickly. People keep doing the, like, the get ripped, and it's totally making me freeze. So we usually like to do this with inviting somebody from the audience up to stage that has no idea what's about to happen to them to play a normal game of Mario. Uh, but I don't have a gamepad, so it's, I'm kind of doing the keyboard here. I don't know. I've, you guys haven't managed to kill me yet. Whoa, what was that? I'm a little scared by the flying Bowser. Hey, hey. I survived. Okay, let's pause all of this to not completely kill my server. Oh wait, wrong, wrong domain. Okay. Pause. Cool, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so there's going to be a bunch more different games and different play modes tonight. Uh, so let's get in a little bit into how all of this happens. Okay. Um, there's an event in Austin, Texas. It's an uh, interactive art and video game festival called Fantastic Arcade. And I think it was two years ago, I go to this event, and uh, I'd never met Andy before. And he was showing a brand new... NES game, like it's on a physical plastic cart. He made a new game that you play on the NES, and it's called Super Russian Roulette, and it is pretty much what it sounds like. You play with a zapper against this cowboy, and this game, despite being in a, a real, legit 8-bit NES game, has like full-screen graphics and animations, and this beautiful country western soundtrack and stuff, and it just pushes the limits of what's possible, and I was amazed. So I go up and talk to him, having ne never met him before, and we start hitting it off about the NES, because I'd kind of done a study of how the NES sprite system works, and I wrote a WebGL shader in, in JavaScript and GLSL that kind of emulates, this is the, the shader running, that emulates like the dying sprite system. Because like, you, if you remember playing NES, sometimes like, you'd have to blow in the cart and the graphics would get scrambled, and so this is kind of emulating that. And we, so we hit it off, and I, I told him about some of the, the mul massively multiplayer game stuff I was doing. Um, so I did this game called Apestronauts for Node Knockout years ago, and another one called Narwhal Knights, which is like massively multiplayer joust, but you're on a narwhal instead of an ostrich, and you use the tusk to uh, joust. Um, and so he was like, wait a minute, um, why don't we take your massively multiplayer JavaScript stuff and my NES stuff and mash these two things together? And this is the first time I met him, the first day I met him at this festival, and I said, absolutely, let's do that. And, and so I went back to my flat at the conference and started coding this thing. And the next morning, I came to Andy's booth where he was showing his game. And, I, and this is the original version of the UI. And I said, hey, you know, like, let's, I coded it last night. Let's try it. Um, and, you know, but this is like, so this is Andy, you guys, this is another photo of him. And despite like both of us playing video games and partying the entire festival, we managed to put this thing together. And this is like now, like less than 48 hours from the idea we see this happen in Contra. If you remember Contra, that's the level one boss. And we just jumped up and over in the end boss in Contra into just uncharted territory in the game. And this was kind of the moment where I was like, this is a thing, like this is, this is special. Um, and so this is then, you know, the, that same day, Andy had a talk, invited me onto the talk to show the thing we just collaborated on. Um, he's like coding, like 
before he speaks, like on stage, like last minute stuff. And I'm right next to him, like on the far left there, there's me in a duck hunt t-shirt. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that, that was how it came to be, which is really cool. It's like the magic of festivals like this. You meet someone and you want to collaborate. Um, so a little bit about the NES, and this is the part that Andy would tell you about. He's, he's the hardware guy, uh, and I'll do my best without him. So um, the crazy thing, one, one very crazy thing about the NES is the entire RAM of the NES was two kilobytes, like 2048 bytes. So that's like 15 tweets, entire, all of program RAM. Um, and so what Andy did, uh, when we do this off the physical hardware, what Andy did was he uh, used what's called dual port RAM, which is RAM that two different CPUs can read write at the same time. So he actually desoldered the RAM off the NES motherboard and put on his own custom daughter board to talk to the dual port RAM uh, over serial. And so he modded the box to have uh, a serial plug that looks like a headphone jack that just goes into the back of the NES. And otherwise, you can't tell it's not a normal NES. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a diagram of the Game Genie, because it's important, again, to make the distinguish, dis, uh, distinguish this. So the Game Genie modified ROM. It sat between the cart and the NES and changed the values that were being read off the, the read-only memory on the plastic cart. But our modification is directly into the RAM, the working memory of the Nintendo, which lets us do things you could never do with the Game Genie. Um, so here's just some examples of what you can do with this. So Andy made a giant hockey buzzer for Blades of Steel and a scoreboard, and it's reading RAM off the, the console, and then you know you get a goal, and it, and it fires off this thing. Um, he did a mod for Contra with a strobe. So every time you fire the gun, you get a strobe. Um, and then uh, this is something that I can show you more of later, but like you can hex edit and do crazy things. Like there he's hex editing the whip in uh, Castlevania and like he was no longer, it was like whipping different sprites like that are no longer like the whip. Um, okay, so what's going on in the stack? So there's the physical NES console, or in this case you saw an emulator uh, and there's a, a script that talks serial to the NES. Um, there was a node server that all of you connected to and with real-time communication with Socket.io. Um, and, and definitely there's some actual ghosts in the mix here. The back end is actually really simple. Um, we first made this like two years ago and I wanted to show my package.json because it's like kind of silly how little is in here and how old some of these versions are. Which I thought, you know, I mean, in the, in the age of, of, you know, tons and tons of libraries and stuff like that, um, I kind of appreciate the, the old school. Um, and so back to the diagram a little bit. So I'm just using Express to basically serve up the, the client to you. The, the, all of the UI is in that first HTML push, um, and then it's a JavaScript after that that all speaks Socket.io to the server. Um, you've got a peek at our little backend admin gateway to switch the game modes. Um, and uh, the Socket.io server that sits between you and the NES is basically maintaining the, the state of whatever like metagame you are all playing. Um, and it's mapping your button presses to physical RAM addresses in that 2048 bytes of memory and, and creating a, basically a delta change file that's saying the audience has changed these bytes to these values and that's what gets sent off to a script to write those values to serial uh, to the NES. Um, front end is, is also you know, pretty standard stuff. I'm not even using like a, 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 I mean the UI is not super complicated, so it's, it's just like query replacing stuff. It's not even uh, React or anything like that. Um, Sock.io for the real-time communication, and I grabbed a little library called FastClick just for backwards compatibility with uh, devices, so uh, there's not that 300 millisecond lag when you're pushing buttons, uh, which some of you might know about from mobile. Um, you didn't see this, but you'll see it tonight. So um, when you're playing, a, a game, like you're playing Mario, in real time, like I can instantly change to another game. You don't have to like reload or anything, it just switches. So you'll, all of a sudden all your phones will be in Tetris mode, all your phones will be in Contra mode. Um, and, and that's pretty simple, like the client is basically just waiting for the server to say, hey, we're now playing Tetris, and then all of your UIs flip over. Um, 
And there's just like a simple JavaScript controller uh, for each different game that then takes over uh, listening for UI events and sending uh, data over the socket IO stream. Um, this is kind of like random, but uh, you know, in case you know, any of you weren't familiar with this, there's like the long-time restriction of only being able to play audio on the web if you um, uh, in a click event. Like you have to, you have to like touch something, and then you can load and play an audio file. And I, when we wanted it so that we had that creepy, like all those bells were ringing when you guys, when the, when it activated, and that wasn't on click. And so this is like a hack, where you basically the first time someone touches the screen, you set the volume really low on the sound, and and it, and put an on time update listener. And as soon as it starts playing, you pause it, and then you can use it later anytime you want procedurally. You don't have to use another UI event to play the audio. And I, I'm assuming. Lots of you probably can't read that code <laughs> in the back. That's all right. Uh, the client socket code is like way less than 64 lines to do all of that back and forth. It's, it's really pretty simple. Um, JavaScript's kind of amazing for, for prototyping and for rapidly doing stuff, as I'm sure a lot of you know. Like To be able to build something like this in, in a day um, really speaks, I think, to the power of JavaScript. So the emulator that you saw to tell you a little bit more about that, uh, there's, a, there's a C++ emulator called FCEUX, which is a great NES emulator. Um, and then an mscripten is a tool that compiles from C++ to ASM.js. And so uh, and, and my finish is not great, but it, uh, Val, Valtteri Heikila, I think? Uh, uh, there, there's a URL, bitbucket.org slash TS1. Um, they were the ones to originally do the mscript and compile of FCUX and did amazing work uh, optimizing the WebGL and web audio APIs that were being used. And so not only does it run at 50 frames a second, but it has far and away the best audio and music reproduction of any of the JavaScript NES emulators, because there are a few. Um, so it's kind of incredible that you can just straight up transpile C++ to JavaScript and get such an awesome result. Um, and so what I did was I took that code, grabbed the original C++ code, and just put in um, some new hooks to access the RAM and expose those to JavaScript and then recompiled. And then that lets me use an emulator like you saw today. Uh, and that was really important because I'm from Minneapolis and Andy is out in Brooklyn, in New York City. And so we're in two completely different parts of the United States. And basically, we need to be able to do uh, research with each other, like find these RAM values that are interesting. What's the RAM value that makes Mario swim? What's the RAM value that makes Mario shrink or change the colors on the screen? Um, and so the way that we actually did that was peer-to-peer uh, -peer hex editing of the 2048 bytes of RAM. And so, um, uh, and I can actually show that. Uh, let's see. So let's go to another demo. Let's maybe do, let's do, well, why not Contra, I guess. So now I can find my hex editor. Oh, yeah. So this is a live hex editor of the RAM. This is one page of RAM, so 256 bytes. And I can, I can kind of page through memory and see everything that's going on. And this lets you essentially do like both archaeology on what's going on in these games um, and also find out where you can do these hacks. And some of the stuff is really interesting. Like here, like this looks like something, right? And it turns out like this matches um, some values with the uh, uh, color cycling that's going on in the palette. And you can also tend to find uh, music in the engine too. You can see where like the, the music is playing. This one doesn't have a lot of music, but. Um, and so I can actually go through here and Andy in New York would be able to do this too. We'd have two little cursors and we'd go around and we'd start playing with values. And so I can do that. I can just start changing RAM values here. And it's amazing how resilient these old games were. See, like I'm corrupting a bunch of random bytes and it's actually not crashing it. So let me go into play mode here. Okay. 
and the, the first 256 bytes of RAM are by far the most kind of interesting to have there, you see? That, ki yeah, that killed me right away. <laughs> but it's mostly this kind of first page that really is result. Whoa, it's still toast, okay. That's normal, that sounds normal. Let's see if I can find something else fun real quick. see what this bite does. Or maybe this one. Oh. See that? Yeah? So I know there's a bite in here somewhere that you will instantly win the game, and I would really love to see if I can just happen upon that one. That would be great. Let's see. Yes! Oh, this is, I won the level, not the game. There's another one where literally, like, the helicopter comes in and the credits roll. Like, wherever you are, it's great. Um... So yeah, so the way I can I can go back to the talk for a little yeah 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 sorry everybody. Um, okay, so the way that that works is uh, I use Pure JS, which is a really slick and easy to use uh, WebRTC wrapper, and WebRTC is a little bit different than what Socket IO and WebSockets had been because WebRTC is first of all peer to peer which allowed Andy and my computer to connect directly, which is nice when you're 60 frames a second sharing 256 bytes. Um, so you have peer-to-peer -peer and it's binary data. And I, and I think WebSockets have gone on to support binary, but they used to always be strings. And so there's that tremendous overhead uh, of having to send two characters for a, a single value or more. And so WebRTC is binary data over the pipe and peer-to-peer, -peer, which is really slick. Uh, I was really happy with that. It, wasn't, it was pretty easy, really, to put together this uh, hex editor. Um, so this is a, an example of like archaeology in an NES game. So this is Dragon Warrior 2, which is an RPG for NES. Um, and I decided to enumerate every vet possible value for inventory. And I originally did this in the English, English language version of the game. And I just went like 1 to 255. What is every possible thing you can have in inventory? All the swords, all the armor, all the potions. And I found this thing that showed up as perilous which is like an English word that means danger. And uh, you could equip it and you could use it, but nothing would happen. And I'm like, what is this thing? This does not appear anywhere in the game and I'm Googling it, I don't find anything. So then I hop over to the Japanese version of Dragon Warrior 2 and I do the same thing. I enumerate all of the values that you can have. And now I have to compare them one to one with English because I'm like, well, what if they're ordered completely different in the Japanese version? And so I'm like, from these, I don't know any Japanese and from these bitmaps, I'm trying to figure out the characters and then, the, and then use the uh, Unicode and paste it into Google Translate. And I'm like, sure enough, this is an herb. This is the, the great sword. This is the so-and-so's armor and everything's lining up. And it turns out that Perilous in the Japanese version uh, is music box of death. And, <laughs> and I originally, because I, I don't speak any Japanese, I originally translated it as music box of teeth. And it wasn't, it wasn't until the first time presenting to a crowd like this that somebody who knows Japanese was like, uh, you know, like, that's, that doesn't say that. Um, and so then I did some more searching, like music box of death. That didn't really turn anything up. Then I you know, copied and pasted the, the Unicode Japanese characters and did a search for that. And I found like one single forum post, like old forum post, that was like a Dragon, uh, what's it, uh, Dragon Quest like con or something. Somebody had asked about this to one of the creators and they said that it was a debugging item that uh, they used to kill the entire party at will. If they needed to test death. Uh, and they just disabled it for the, for the production release. And this kind of thing is actually really common. Like uh, Andy found uh, a two-player mode in the, the shipped Tetris, the retail version of Tetris that shipped, well, one of the two for the NES, has a hidden two-player mode that's like half-baked, and so they just turned it off. But you can play it. You can find the bite in memory, and you just flick it, and now you're playing two-player Tetris. And so there's stuff like this in these old games, um, and it's really fascinating. Um, Okay, let's see. Well, actually, so uh, rather than do questions, 
do we want to do another demo? Yeah, okay. And I have like five minutes, right? Yeah. Okay, let's do a demo. Okay, let's do, let's do Tetris. Because it has great music. Okay, one second here. <laughs> nice clown emoji, whoever's name was clown emoji. So again, the URL, if you don't still have it in your history, it was nestspector.com, like the name of the talk, nestspector.com, or you can go to that one. Uh, Tetris mode, resume. Okay, here we go. So you are corrupting Tetris while also voting on what my next piece is gonna be. <laughs> and there are a lot of you in here, holy cow. So if you all were nice and all pushed the same button, then I would get that piece. Or you can continue to just be really mean. <laughs> so what's going on is you're, you're voting on what the next piece is gonna be, but s some of the pieces, are like here, look, are, are actually out of range. So like you're basically picking a piece that doesn't exist and the, and the game is trying to compensate. And you can hear what you're doing to the music engine when you press that music button. I'm doing all right. And then you're also corrupting that stats panel. Basically, every time you vote, it gets more distorted. Because all of this, the whole stats panel, those pieces and the numbers, like, are all represented in RAM as, like, values of what sprite should show. And so we're just corrupting that. So I can show you now how, let's do this. I can go over here and I can send you all back to Conjuring. And we can go to, back to Mario, let's say. And now I can come over here and I can put you all into Mario mode again. Love that sound. Um, yeah, there you go. And then we also have this, like, extra dangerous mode where you're literally corrupting a completely random bite that could horribly crash the game or do nothing. Oh my god. That's fine, right? Is that a vine? What is even... What? Yeah, that's... That's, I'm sure that's fine. I, I can't even, I, no, I'm just, I'm stuck. I'm stuck, okay. Yikes, okay, pause all. So what I'd like to end with here is, oh, 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 back to my slides. What I'd like to end with is a little teaser. Uh, we're gonna have more games, such as 200 player track and field and that kind of thing. Um, lots of crazy things you can do. You just beat, beat a level by crashing. And uh, here, let's, let's quick show you, oh man, Glass Joe, if I can get it started. No, there we go. Wait for it. That's funny if you know Punch-Out. It's little. Okay, uh, so come see us tonight, 7.30, play more games. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.